our current guest, uh, Professor Hamel. And Professor Hamel, yeah, would you please just uh, stand up? Yeah. So everyone can give you a那現在呢不是他們發現是我們現在南京師範大學的這個法院的所長就是這個法院就是所長那可能那同時也是在這個呃德國的一個在一個聲音有自己的一個意思事務所啊在事務所發言的話說一個在實務在理論上來講的話都
But if you're a medium-sized company, a company that has like 50, 100, or 500 employees, it's different. Because whenever you tackle a new market, you have only limited resources to invest. And you have limited resources to actually protect your IP. For that reason, one of the key issues for medium-sized companies, more or less, to ask the question, if I can actually protect my own IP in a certain market. And that depends not only on the fact if there is a legal system. It's not only depending on the fact if there is any law, if there is any development of law. But finally, it comes to the question, does the court system actually support my interests? And if you come to that question, you have to ask the question, what are the costs I have to invest for the protection? And if, if I win the case, what's the benefit? Do I get any damages? Do I, do I get any compensation? So you see, if you're looking from the practical side, not only from the theoretical side, you need always a system that is working. So a working system that's actually enabling the group of people you are addressing for protection to advocate their rights in that system. And that's for my point of view the key issue that you need a legal system that's working that gives the uh, right holder a case for damage and cost coverage. So in general we have a theory compensation on IPI infringement and as a matter of fact there is an international legal framework on that. Uh, we are not talking about um, national rights. I think IP is one of the best examples how intellectual law can work cross-border. Yeah? If I ask you, do you know anything about cross-border law? And what are the examples of cross-border law? So there's maritime law, there's air and space law. Then some people discuss about international penal law. But as you know, international penal law doesn't really exist. You have an international court in Den Haag advocating on penal law. But the regulations on international penal laws are quite limited. They are limited to war. They are limited to um, outstanding uh, human rights violations. But basically, that's only a portion, a small portion of our penal law. So besides maritime law and air and space law, it's only the intellectual property area which is really international. And if you reflect on it, if you don't have cross-border protection, IP protection doesn't work at all. Because in the globalized world, you need IP protected in each and every market. So there are only a few legal systems which are really international, and IP is definitely one of those. So when we discuss now what are the, the fundamentals for those claims, you will look at the TRIPS agreement. Article 45 of the TRIPS agreement, it's actually the agreement on, on trade, uh, gives you the, the legal framework for those claims. So you won't get any legal basis except by TRIPS. But now that's a small change. As you know, there's the ACTA, that's a new, well, the new contract, that's actually a contract, an anti counterfeiting trade agreement can be signed since May this, of this year. And Article 9 of ACTA gives you another legal ground for asking for damages and cost compensation. Just getting rid of my <laughs> jacket because it's really warm up here. So the basic question is always, how do you calculate damages? So in principle, according to civil law, damages are granted uh, to put the right holder in position before infringement. Yeah? And so far, you get actually compensation for the situation before infringement and after infringement. But how do you calculate those? So there are several ways of calculating damages. The first way of doing it is asking for damages according to lost profits of right holder. But if you want to define what are lost profits of right holder, the first question is, is it all you will sell in the future? 
but who can give you the figure what we would have sold in the future without infringement? It's always an open issue because if you ask a judge to judge on what would have happened without the infringement, you won't get a clear answer. And if, if you ask the right holder, please give us evidence on that, you will have the same trouble. Yeah? He will say, well, normally I have a percentage, let's say, 5 to 10% increase per year. I didn't have that last year. But that can have been caused by world crisis. It can be caused by more competitors, not, not effective by somebody who copied it. So as you can see, the right holder has a huge difficulty to present evidence at court that his lost profits derive directly from somebody who copied or infringed his right. The same is true for the second way of calculated damages. Damages according to gain profits of infringer. To give evidence of the gain profits of infringer, you first need the bookkeeping. You need the bookkeeping of the infringer. So if you think about all the sweatshops somewhere in a city, and you go to the sweatshops and ask them for bookkeeping, they will really smile at you because they don't have. If they have, they burn it before. Yeah? So, same problem, same issue, you go to court, you try to calculate the damages, and the judge is asking you, what are the gain profits of the infringer? Well, you can give an educated guess, but give me a judge who is relying on the educated guess of the right holder. You won't find one. So once again, we need a certain way of calculating that's the reason why in the legal work we came up with a third way of calculating damages, just saying damages will be calculated according to the license analogy. Yeah? So we say, if I would have licensed out my product to the infringer, I can, as you can see from other license agreements, get a third portion on all items I license out. And that's definitely the way mostly used from right holders and their lawyers uh, to advocate the damages in front of courts. Uh, Besides that, we have uh, two different ways of, of Catholic damages in mainland China. So in mainland China you will find in all IP laws, regulations, uh, statutory damages. That's to make the life of a judge easier because he has a, just the, the, the way saying, well, According to law, we have a certain amount of damages we can actually give to the right holder in case of infringement. So he's totally free in judging what the amount will be. But whereas an upside, there's always a downside. And the downside is actually that those statutory damages are limited. So for trademark infringements, design infringements, and all that kind of infringements, it's limited to 500,000 IMB. Only in patent cases, you will have a well, the top, the top cap of 1 million, but you know 1 million IMB, it's not really a big chunk for a big company. It's nice to have, but if you think about legal costs, it's not really what we're looking for. When finally you can ask for additional damages according to reputation or moral right infringement. So that's actually a, a more, more a useful element to double or triple the damages because you say besides the damages, the actual economical damages, I have a damage in reputation and the moral rights are infringed and for that reason you can ask the judge for a double or triple damage according to the calculation above. So you see the whole system is, is quite complicated in practice, although in theory it's easily explained. What I'm actually looking at is, does that work if there is not one legal system or one way of calculating around the world? If you look at the domain dispute cases set up by the Danic and, 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 and those organizations, it's quite unified now. So if you have to have an issue on domains, you can advocate them around the world because you know the, the rules of the game. You know how, how much it costs, how long it will take, and what are the chances. And that makes it easy for all of us. So what I'm thinking about is, and what I'm advocating is to 
find a system that that way of calculating damages becomes unified according to an international regulation. Yeah? And if that would be applied in all markets and all courts, at least there would be a fundamental base to calculate the risk and the damages. Nowadays, as you know, if you're advocating a case in the States or in Europe or in mainland China, you will come up with totally different results, although we are talking about the same issues. Now, in, in legal terms, what you, what you, when you're talking about infringement, when you're talking about damages and costs, yeah? it can't be that I, I'm getting a, a much bigger chunk on the, of the cake in infringement cases because I have punitive damages in the USA, and I won't get it in Europe. Yeah? That's, that's not only unjust, but it's just not balanced. Yeah? So why do I have to run the risk to go to the States with higher costs to get have a chance on a bigger chunk? Why isn't it the same all over the world? Yeah? Even thinking about a court or any kind of legal entity that's able to judge on those damages. Anyhow, uh, the situation now is that we have to work on it as a lawyer and we have to come up with suggestions, doing some research. And that's the reason why I'm together here. The same, what I try to explain about damages is the case about costs. Um, in, in Germany, we have a quite um, interesting system for all people who are doing their legal case or their because you always get compensation according to statutory fees. Yeah? So if you claim certain damage, like let's say 100,000, you can calculate from the beginning what are the legal costs, what are the lawyer's costs, what is actually risk I'm taking. So normally costs comprise court fees, costs comprise appropriate lawyer fees, costs comprise all reasonable expenses for right holders. So think about uh, research, investigation, export, expert reports, notary fees and all that stuff. So all these costs you can normally recover, you should normally can recover after a litigation because these are necessary costs to start litigation. Besides that, it, it's always useful that you have the rule, the general rule that costs are borne by the infringer. Otherwise, because the right holder has to invest the case before starting legal action, yeah, he must have the chance that the infringer is taking over those costs. And finally, costs are reimbursed proportional to the success of the claim. So if you win 50% of the case, you have, to, you have the right to get 50% of the cost covered and the other way around. That means if you start a case, you're able to calculate your risk looking at the amount you're claiming. So maybe you're not claiming the double what you can actually get, only 50%, but if you're claiming 50%, you can get 100% cost recovery. So that's a balanced system. And all those rule, uh, rules are really important to know and to argue before starting litigation. Learning about the theory, now coming to the practice. Practice on compensation of IP infringement in mainland China. Uh, this is actually <coughs> data, the latest data I could get from a Chinese, uh, well, a mainland China source called Siela, China IP Litigation Analysis. And they are quite uh, uh, keen in getting a lot of cases reviewed and put them together in figures. As you know, numbers and especially charts are not easy to read. But I try to explain those charts to you as far as I can. In principle, what you see here is average damages award for all types of IPR by year. That means covering the years 2006 to 2009, so about four years. In general, we have to see that the amount of, or the average amount is not increasing for damages. But we can't really say it's decreasing. It depends on the number of cases. But in, in general, you can see that the, the big issue is that the right holders don't have a clue in how far they really can any, get any damage that is uh, covering their costs and all their efforts before starting litigation. If you look at the average damage awarded 2006 to 2009 according to types of IPR, you see that according to those charts, 
in the patent area, you have the, the biggest chance to get a good portion of damages. But if you make a breakdown, <coughs> you, you can see that actually from the top five in the patent area, the, the biggest case in mainland China was about 50 million damages. The second case was only 10 million. And the third and fourth was only three and two million, and the fifth case, one million, 1.8 million. If you deduct that amount from the top five cases, you will see that all the other cases are in a lower area, a much lower area. So fundamentally, if you're looking at figures, you have to see how many cases actually are calculated and what's the average amount. So the average amount is much lower uh, than the big top of five cases would tell you. And the average of 163 or 163 is really, really low in comparison to a lot of cases we know in the patent area, uh, which mean a lot of investment. If you look at the trademark, the top five cases uh, were actually 10 million, uh, the second 8 million, third 8 million, the fourth 4.7 million, and the fifth 4 million. So once again, if you deduct that amount, you will see that uh, there are a lot of cases which are low uh, average damages awarded. If you look at the unfair competition cases, the biggest uh, un uh, damage paid in an unfair competition case was 4 million, and the second one was 4 million as well, the third one was 2 million, the fourth one was 2 million as well, and the fifth was 1.8 million. So you can see the difference between patent and trademark areas is the damages are much higher in, com in, in comparison to, com uh, to the unfair competition. But the, the average damage is higher. You see, so the, the number of average damage doesn't tell anything. And finally, the copyright area is interesting. The top five damages were 5 million, 2 million, 1.8 million, 1.3 million, and 1.3 million. So once again, you can have a huge damage uh, amount awarded, but uh, if there are a lot of cases, it's really shrinking to only 31,565. Now we are coming to the average damage claimed and awarded. So to see the difference between what you're actually asking for and what you really get by the courts. And there you see once again that the percentage of what you actually get is much lower than what you actually expect. Yeah? So in 2006, you have only 33% of what you get. In 2007, you get only 21%. In 2008 it was like 36% and in 2009 it was like 20%. So it's really low and you can see that actually the issue should be to define the way of calculating damages because that's actually reflecting the data. Yeah? That the right holders didn't have the means to convince the court about the amount of damages because otherwise you can't explain the difference between what you are claiming and what you get by the courts. The net charge is interesting as well because we have now the average damages claimed in the ward according to trademark infringements. Yeah. Once again, if you see here, there's a huge difference between what the people have asked for and what they got by the courts. So in 2006 it was like 29%, 2007 like 29%, 2008, 35%, 2009, 27%, and finally in 2010, like 22%. Once again, there's no clear direction. Once again, it's, it's below uh, around 30%, so it's only one third what they are asking for. Once again, obviously, there are differences between the way of calculating damages and actually a hard way to convince the courts of the amount of damages people ask for. If we are looking at the area of copyright, once again, but now you can see that the amount awarded is much lower. Yeah? So in 2006 it was only 1%. In 2007 it was 28%, in 2008 only 9%, and in 2009 38%. How is that possible? 
Well, it's possible because in copyright cases, it's much more difficult to find out what actually is a profit. Yeah? Because you know that somebody copied a DVD or a CD, but try to figure out what's a profit by selling it. Or even ask how many copies they did. Yeah? How many copies have been sold? And where did they sell the copies? Yeah? So once again, you have the, the difficulty to find the right way to argue your case, especially in respect to damages. Interesting as well is if you look at the average damages claimed and awarded at different courts in 2006 to 2010. Because that's really interesting if you have the choice to go to a certain court. As you know, in IPR cases, you are mostly free to choose a court. You will not necessarily go to the place where the infringer is having this, this sweatshop. You can go to big places where they are selling it, so where the infringement case occurs. So according to those figures, and that's really amazing, it's not Beijing, it's not Shanghai, it's, 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 they are small cities with, uh, well, they are, which are capable to deal with uh, actually interesting cases. And if you look at those, still there's a big difference between what uh, people asked for and what they got by the courts. But anyhow, uh, this data gives you an idea where to go in infringement cases. So if you have an infringement case in Hangzhou, you might think about going to Ningbo or somewhere, somewhere else, because even in Wuhan, you will have a better result than in Hangzhou, maybe. But that's something you have really to follow up, because according to my experience, it becomes more and more important to go to specialized courts. And as you know, in Beijing, Shanghai, and even in Nanjing, they have now specialized courts on IP, and there are young professional judges with a good educational background. And if you have those well-educated judges over there, it's much easier as a lawyer for you to advocate the case. And therefore, I think this data is interesting, but I think it will change over the years now. So coming from the damages, we will see that the, the cost is, issue is nearly the same. Yeah. So in the, the patent area, you have average costs claimed and awarded, and once again, a huge difference between those claims. The same is true for trademark, and the same is true for copyright. And average cost claimed and awarded for all types, you can see, according to the venue of, of uh, the judicial system, uh, you have an even worse uh, discrepancy between uh, average cost awarded and claimed. But once again, the problem in the main China system is that there is no legal regulation on that. The, the, the courts are actually free to give you a cost uh, award after um, an injunction or any litigation, or they can introduce it as part of the damages. So you have even cases without any cost recovery. That's the reason because there's no legal wording, there's no legal groundwork on that. So you have always to argue this point of cost coverage in each and every case. And every judge is free to argue on it from his side. And to my knowledge and to my research, in most cases uh, they won't try to get it as part of the damages and they're not advocating it besides. Okay, conclusions. Right holders are legally successful in court. That's, I think, good news. More and more right holders are successful. Second conclusion, right holders damage the world are small at present. That's really a bad news. The second, the third bad news, right holders cost the world are small at present. The reason I try to explain. The evidence proceeding should be strengthened in favor of the right holder. So it must be easier to advocate damages and costs in court because you need a legal regulation that is helping the lawyer to advocate the case. And finally, the right holder should have a separate claim for costs, which is the wording, which is in text. Without that, you are hopelessly devoted to the judgment of the judge.
Thanks a lot for listening, and if there are any questions, feel free.